All right, let's watch the get out one. Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Get Out, released in 2017 by writer-director Jordan Peele in his directorial debut. I'm doing this movie back-to-back -back with Night of the Living Dead because Peele has cited Romero's seminal one. work as a major influence. Chad, imagine if we just did a meetup right now. Man, more or less isolated inside How many of people y'all think will come? And while that may be where the similarities end on the surface, both movies ended up being huge in what they said about race. Now, while Romero has said he didn't intentionally create Night of the Living Dead as a form of racial commentary, Jordan Peele definitely did with Get Out. This movie's got a whole lot of things to say about systemic racism, with My Peele bad. specifically saying Bruce it's about the lack the of acknowledgement. Exists. But it's also a really well-crafted movie in general, with an amazing cast, some nice twists, and while we have to wait, this until movie the end, was scary. Some pretty great kills. Now I'm not 100% qualified to discuss all the sociological aspects of this film, but I've pretty much got a PhD in talking about kills. So let's get to them. The movie begins with a cold open, where a black guy is walking down the street in a neighborhood he's not entirely comfortable in. Confused. Bruce. Doesn't Jones. help when a car driving Ever. by pulls a Yui and starts following him. The guy tries to turn around across the street, but he's accosted by someone in a knight's helm who puts him in a headlock and knocks him out. He drags him Love away, too, puts man. him in the trunk of his car, and drives away as the credits start. There are a couple of cool songs over them, including Childish Gambino's Red Bull. Yeah, because it actually can happen, so it's like weird. So basically, this movie was basically, basically about like eliminating all the black people out of the suburbs and then making them like... Making them suburb, like, like whitewashed, basically. Whitewashed. I can never get whitewashed. I'm sorry. Like, that is just one thing that will never happen. Like, no matter what. Like, I feel like if I was whitewashed, I'd have, like, a bang. Like, one of those swoops. On some, like, swoops. I would. I might get whitewashed just so I could get that, that, that hairstyle. You already are? How? Tell me how. If I was whitewashed, I would stop saying What the f***? Just because I'm cool with white people don't mean I'm whitewashed. What are you talking about? Stupid And that's just one more reason you should probably go watch this movie for real instead of just kill counting it up like I know so many of you do. After the credits, we meet our hero Chris Washington, a photographer getting ready for his first visit to the home of his girlfriend. Ray hey, Armour. wasn't he on? What other movie was he on? Super good looking couple and totes in love. He might even love her more than his adorable puppy Sid. But something is bothering him. Do they know him? Do they know I'm black? Rose says no, but that it doesn't matter because her parents are nice, non racist, liberal folk. My dad would have voted for I know what he was on. Ray Shadow Legends. Exclamation point Ray. This man, Bruce, be laughing at my jokes and and be screaming at me. I be thinking I know this man in real life. Yo, you're sick, bro. Obama a third time if he could have. Chris is still nervous enough to want to smoke, even though Rose ain't having it since she's trying to get him to quit. Chris avoids that becoming an argument by calling up his buddy Rod, who works at TSA and is going to be watching Sid over the weekend. Rod's skeptical of Chris's weekend plans. You never take my advice. Like what? Like don't go to a white girl parent's house. But Chris doesn't think anything of it. They end up hitting a deer that jumps in front of the car, and while they're sorting it all out with a cop, things get a little uncomfortable. Sir, can I see your license, please? Wait, why? Yeah, I have state ID. Rose gets up in arms about the way the cop is treating Chris, whereas Chris reacts like this is everyday shit for him, because, you know, it probably is. Doesn't stop him from appreciating it, though. It was hot. Hot. I mean, I can't let anyone fuck with my man. Oh, they're so cute, guys. I love them. They arrive at the Armitage <laughs> estate, where Father Dean and Mother Missy give them a warm welcome. Dean even says he's happy they hit a deer. I say one down, a couple Nick in the chat just said, if it ain't snowing, I ain't going. God forgive me. Okay. I see a dead deer on the side of the road. I think to myself, that's a start. Man, he really doesn't like deer. I wonder if that's code for something. It's probably nothing. Dean seems to be just a goofy dad who's excited to give Chris a tour of the house, including a picture of his dad who just narrowly lost against Jesse Owens to qualify for the Olympics. And in case Damn. you didn't know, Jesse Owens was a black sprinter who kicked ass at the 19th. Oh my God, I didn't catch that. What the fuck? I did not catch that when I first watched this movie. House, including a picture of his dad who just narrowly lost against Jesse Owens. Oh my God, so they hate black niggas. Losing to a black person in the Olympics? Boy, what? 
Hey, thank you for the 10. Get the sub, easy money. I appreciate it. ...to qualify for the Olympics. And in case you didn't know, Jesse Owens was a black sprinter who kicked ass at the 1936 Olympics in Berlin and, quote, single-handedly crushed Hitler's myth of Aryan supremacy. You can already see there's going to be a lot of symbolism in this movie. Yeah. During the tour, Chris also meets the Armitage's house staff, including Georgina the cook and Walter the groundskeeper. Dean admits that it looks bad, but that they hired them to help Dean's ailing parents and they just kept them on after his parents passed. Chris's mom has also passed away, as he reveals during tea time, wherein it also comes out that Missy is a therapist who could use hypnosis to help Chris kick his smoking habit. How about it, Chris? Want these rich white strangers fucking around inside your brain? I'm good at you. Good call, Dean. Rose's brother Jeremy arrives, and that night they all sit down for a family dinner. Embarrassing stories are shared and laughs are had, but some things seem a little off, and I don't just mean Jeremy's. Yo, this movie is on the same level of a mon fuck as Midsummer, to be honest hair hygiene. I'm talking about shit like Georgina's behavior. Earlier, she wigged out while pouring some drinks, and now seems to be just kind of catatonic in the kitchen. And Jeremy's all kinds of creepy, asking Chris real intently if he's ever done MMA. With your frame and your genetic makeup, if you really pushed your body, you'd be a fucking beast. He even tries to drunkenly engage in some jujitsu, but the rest of the family shuts it down. At least Rose seems to be aware of how weird her family's acting, as she complains in her underwear to Chris that night and compares her family to the cop they faced earlier. Chris has a moment of I told you so, but they assure each other of their love and go to bed. Chris has a hard time sleeping that night, so he heads out back for a cigarette, and it's the perfect time for the movie to dial up its weirdness. Daddy. Walter cranks it up a few notches, and he runs <laughs> at Chris full speed like he's groundskeeper Flash, and Georgina throws it to 11 by doing glamour poses in the reflection of the window. To cap off Chris's evening, of what the fuckery. On his way back to bed, he gets confronted by Missy, who's chilling in this chair ready to grill him on his smoking. Do you smoke in front of my daughter? The conversation then moves into Chris's mother's death, and Chris realizes that Missy may be starting her hypnosis. Wait, are we? Where were you when she died? He doesn't want to go along with it, but Missy keeps stirring her spoon and he seems unable to resist. Apparently, his mom died on her way home from work while he was a kid watching TV, and he feels guilty because he never called anyone to try to help her. To be fair though, that would have been like prime Nick Toon era television, so don't feel too bad, Chris. Damn! This is one of many scenes that exemplify the outstanding talent of Daniel Kaluuya, who, by the way, is British as fuck and is doing an impeccable American accent throughout this entire movie. He's eventually paralyzed by her hypnosis, and then she sends him away. No. So this is where shits just went left. This is where he couldn't leave. Sink into the floor. Wait, 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 wait. Sink. And sink he does, falling into an endless void and a very memorable effect that makes him seem like he's floating in a mixture of deep sea and deep space. Physically, he's still in his chair, frozen, and Missy leans into his face and tells him where he is. Now you're in the sunken place. That is a place I do not want to be. She shuts his eyes and he wakes up in bed the next morning, covered in sweat and pretty friggin' confused. Later that day, he tries to make small talk with Walter, who seems more than a little off in his mannerisms and especially the way he talks about Rose. One of a kind, top of the line, a real doggone keeper. <laughs> He also confirms that Chris was indeed sitting with Missy in a session. Chris tells Rose about it and says that her hypnosis did seem to work and that the thought of cigarettes makes him want to throw up now. And now it's time to get a party started. The Armitages are having their annual the collection of old- pin you against the wall, what are you doing? Um, I will not be in that position, bro, but I can tell you what I am playing. Exclamation point raid. Um, make sure y'all download raid using that link. Thousand. Um, and 580 downloads, nigga. $2,000 giveaway, facts. Yo, what's up, X? What's going on? Old white people over, some kind of tradition that was started by Dean's parents. All of them are super awkward around Chris, asking him about his golf form, feeling all up on his muscles, and telling him about how cool it is that he's black. Black. Is in fashion. Chris understandably <laughs> steps away and is relieved when he finally spots another black guy at the party, hey, a guy no. named Logan. But this dude's pretty weird too, and it's not just his Thurston Howell attire. He's also shacking up with this lady many years his senior and kind of rats on Chris to her. Chris was just telling me how he felt much more comfortable with my being here. Then he goes over and Bro, this is not what OTK did to me, okay? This is not what happened when I went to the OTK house. If anything, it was the opposite. They let me walk out of rooms when I cringed, all right? They did. When it was too much for me, it was too cringy, I walked the fuck out. Easily. This why I don't date white bitches. Understandable, you know. What happened when when ha what happened in that room where where it was what who? Miss Kip and Alinity? I got uncomfortable, I left. I was too high. To be honest. I thought I was in an episode of Get Out, bro. I really did the whole time I was there. But it wasn't that, you know, it was just, you know. It happens, you know. I feel like everybody gets that instinct as like a black person when you're around a whole bunch of white people, you get like kind of nervous. 
I don't know, bro. It's just an instinct. It is. I'm gonna be real. I don't know why though. Probably because I didn't grow up around a lot of white people, so it's always like, I don't know, like damn, you know. It's understandable. Girls for the other party goers. Beard guy approves. Seems like Chris is doomed to be in. Goes both ways. I know, right? Ain't that crazy? It's crazy the fact that it goes both ways. That's the crazy part. Entirely uncomfortable here until he runs into Jim Hudson of Wine Segregation, Arkansas, man. Familiar with Segregation. And tells him it's very impressive. Jim also tried to be a photographer, but then he lost his eyesight. Both of them reflect upon how that shit. But I love OTK. They really, they really cool as fuck, and all of them are down to earth. You would expect them not to be down to earth because of like how big they are, but like they're really dead ass the nicest people they, that I've ever met. Way better than Two Hype. I'm gonna be honest. And Two Hype is a group of niggas. So, yeah. Fair. When Chris goes inside to take a breather from the whole situation, this happens. <laughs> Fuck them niggas. Dead ass. Yeah, just a little creepy, huh? Also creepy is that he keeps finding his phone unplugged and he thinks it might be Georgina. She comes in later to apologize to him and he tries to be real with her. There's too many white people I get nervous, you know. But it uh kind of <laughs> seems to break her. Oh no. 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 No, 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 no. She assures him the Armitages are good to them and treat them like family. Chris checks in with Rod and tells him about all the weird shit going on, and Rod gives up. Bro, I beat Cash in a 1v1. Shut up. That's the comic relief we expect from Jordan Peele. I don't know if you know this. White people love making people sex slaves and shit. Rod's serious, though. He doesn't trust the hypnosis that Chris tells him about and really thinks it's a sex slave ring going on. Downstairs, more of the partygoers grill Chris about his experience as a black man living in America. And when he tries to pull Logan over to field the question, Logan starts going on about how great it is. Chris tries to snap a picture of Logan to show to Rod later, but the flash goes off and this triggers something in Logan, whose nose starts bleeding as he reminds Chris the name of the movie that they're in. You only no. need to Sorry, stop no. the black Missy and Dean try to explain it all the way as a seizure and Logan apologizes like for his actions and leaves. In Chris and Rose territory. go for a walk where he tells her it wasn't a seizure and that he feels like he knew Logan. No, I don't know Logan. I knew the guy that come at me. They argue for a little bit until he opens up more about his mom and reveals that a phone call would have saved her life since she had lain dying for hours after her accident. Rose agrees to leave with him and they embrace, reaffirming their love once more. While this is happening, the old folks back at the Armitage estate are having a sort of silent auction with Chris's portrait on display. Oh my sure. god, they were auctioning him off. What's going on here, but by the end of it... As a slave it's like jim hudson has won out at an impressive price it's a really interesting scene that manages to feel super sinister even when you don't quite know the import of it right away chris and rose get back to the house where everyone stares them down with joyless smiles and jeremy plays the ukulele like he's auditioning for deliverance chris sends rod the picture he took of logan and rod tells him it's a dude named andre that they know and have met before he was the guy in the cold open of the movie actually and he's yeah. been missing for six months now rod falls back on his theory sex slave Oh shit! But Chris's phone dies before they can talk further. Chris relays to Rose how urgently they need to leave, and then he notices a little cubby door open. He peeks inside and finds a box of pictures of Rose with a bunch of different black guys. She was on this shit too. She was in on this shit too, bro. Even though she told, I forgot. I watched it. I watched this movie when it first came out, so I forgot most of the shit that happened. But I forgot she was in on this shit too, bro. Told him he was the first black boyfriend she ever had. Even weirder is when he finds pictures of her with Andre and then with Walter and Georgina. What the fuck is going on here, Chris? Chris goes to leave, but the family isn't interested in letting him go, and Rose just can't seem to find her keys. The weirdness breaks. This is not one of those movies that you just rewatch over and over and over again. I'm sorry. It's just it's not one of those movies, bro. It's one of those movies where you see it once or twice, and then that's it. Like that's it. I feel like that's that the that's the way like these movies should be watched for real. It, it's not, bro. You cannot. I cannot watch this movie over and over again. It's like that movie that Michael B. Jordan in, um, uh, about the black dude that got killed in the train station. You can't watch that movie more than fucking once. Like it's just a sad movie. It's uncomfortable. It's out into the open now with Dean talking about some heavy cryptic shit. We are the gods. Fruitville Captain. Station, yeah. Coons. Jeremy even takes a swipe at Chris and then Rose reveals that she has the keys, but Chris can't have them. Na 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 na. He finally goes to make a run for it, but the hypnosis strikes, paralyzing Chris and knocking him to the ground. Falling into the sunken place, he watches as Dean and Jeremy carry him away. Rose feebly tells him that he was one of her favorites. Now we're gonna hang with Rod for a bit while he tries to call Chris and figure out what the hell's going on. He researches Andre online, revealing that he's the one guy in the world who uses Bing then takes his findings to the police. How can I help you? Rod Williams from a TSA. He shows Andre's picture to Detective Latoya and it reveals his ultimate theory about brainwashing and sex slavery. <laughs> 
Oh, Lord. Rod Williams. Chat, I need to smoke her. Yeah, needless to say, she and the two cops she pulls in to hear him out don't really believe him. Meanwhile, Chris wakes up in a sort of game room, bound to a chair and facing an old school television. It starts playing a tape of Dean's dad, Roman Armitage, who looks like a spokesman for high fiber diets and who explains to the viewer that they've been chosen due to their genetic gifts. He says the coagula procedure will combine those physical traits with the determination and intelligence of white people to create a perfect being. Then a teacup appears on screen and sends Chris back to sleep. He wakes up again to find Jim Hudson on the TV, able to interact with him via some sort of intercom. Hudson tells him he's supposed to prepare him mentally for the procedure they're about to undergo, which involves pretty much a brain transfer, although a sliver of Chris will remain along with his brainstem. You'll be able to see and hear what your body is doing, but your existence will be as a passenger. That's right, he's gonna be living in the sunken place. Fucking terrifying, right? Chris asks why it's with black people, and Jim mentions how several people want the perceived physical superiority of their race, but... <laughs> hey man, it's true. We the best. No DJ Khaled. You know? We the best. We the best music, nigga. Yo, Bruce. Wanna hit us with a quick 24? For the culture? But then Jim's not um, like that, no. you know, some of his best friends are black. He just wants Chris's eyes. He signs off and Chris plays with some of the chair stuffing that he's torn we out. The Eventually, best the teacup music. comes back on screen and knocks him out. Dean gets going with the procedure, with Nurse Jeremy assisting him. He cuts open Jim Hudson's head, and while the heart monitor keeps beeping steadily along, I'm gonna add Jim to the kill count right now, because, spoiler alert, he ain't ever coming back from this situation. Weird that our first kill isn't until nearly an hour and a half into the movie, but this film's about a lot more than just kills. While Dean's handling that brain meat, Jeremy goes to get Chris's unconscious body. With Jeremy's back turned, Chris takes a bocce ball and nails Jeremy, <laughs> hitting him once more while he's on the ground for yeah. two We see that he saved himself from hypnosis by literally picking that cotton out of the chair and stuff it Okay, in his ear. dead meat. Oh my god, it's another it's another one of those things that he did to save himself. Oh my god. It's deeper than that, chat. It's deeper than that. No, no, no. It's deeper than that. It's deeper than that. We we didn't we didn't look at him picking the cotton to save himself. It's deeper than that. It's deeper than that. Oh my god. The symbolism in this movie is crazy. Wow reclamation chris dean comes out of the operating room to see where jeremy this is why you watch a movie multiple times true is and chris surprises him by impaling him with the antlers of a but you still don't understand this shit until you watch this though you know Who you think will win in a fight your dj Khaled? <laughs> me what the fuck? Deerhead for the second kill of the movie. Even more fun symbolic stuff here, since buck is a term historically used against black men in post-reconstruction America. On his way out, Chris runs into Missy, who reaches for her teacup but doesn't make it before Chris smashes it to pieces. They have a short standoff oh before she takes a letter opener and tries to stab him with it, but he takes it through the hand like a champ and turns Ooh! it back around on her, stabbing her in the head or maybe even the eye there just off screen. Hey Missy, stop stabbing yourself. Almost out the front door, Chris is attacked by Jeremy, who's come back into consciousness and is eager to finally get his jujitsu match on with Chris. He almost puts Chris to sleep with a headlock, but Chris stabs him in the leg with that letter opener and then kicks him down, ultimately killing him with a series of super violent, super squishy kicks to the fucking head. Get out of here, Jeremy, go. you nasty little racist weasel. Next time, try dry shampoo. Rose hasn't heard all this because she's been too busy listening to white people music and cruising the internet for her next potential victim. All while Ain't that about a bitch. This bitch eating cereal and drinking the milk. I ought to slap the fuck out of you. Eating Fruit Loops in an overtly symbolic way. Notice how she separates the white milk from the colored cereal. Oh my god, bitch. 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 Oh my god. Outside, Chris takes Jeremy's car, which is shown to be the one from the cold open that drove away with Andre in the trunk. But before he can get away, he hits Georgina. Feeling remorse from his mother's death and Georgina's earlier breakdown, he saves her and takes her in the car with him. But when she comes to, she attacks him and causes him to crash the car. Would've killed her ass too, I'm sorry. This accident kills Georgina, who is revealed to be housing the brain and soul or whatever of Dean's mother, Marion Armitage. Not anymore though, cause now they both dead. Rose has finally gotten savvy to the situation and- Would've killed her ass too. Hunts Chris down with a rifle. She sicks Walter on him, who is 
housing the brain and soul or whatever. Would have killed his dumb ass too. But Chris pulls his camera flash trick again, triggering an awakening in whoever's sunken inside Walter. He asks Rose for the gun to finish the job himself, but shoots her in the belly instead. He then turns the gun on himself, killing the Roman Walter combo for the sixth kill of the movie. Rose is still alive and she tries to grab the gun, but Chris she beats her to it and slides it away from her. He starts to strangle her, but a cop car shows up, and holy shit, guys, this could be the darkest fucking ending I've ever seen. Like, we just watched Night of the Living Dead. We saw that racist cop in the beginning, and we know the historical context surrounding this moment as Chris puts his hands up in a gesture that says, don't shoot. I was all ready to have my heart broken, but out of the cop car steps Rod Williams, TSA. Chris gets in the car, and Rod has his own moment of I told you so, before Chris asks him how the hell he figured everything out. I'm T.S. <laughs> motherfucking A. We handle shit. That's what we do. Yep. Consider this situation fucking handle. With the situation fucking handle, they drive off, leaving Rose to die in the middle of the road for our seventh and final kill of the movie. Turns out the original ending did actually have Chris arrested for strangling Rose to death, but Jordan Peele felt like there was just too much real shit going on and that his protagonist needed a win. Also, for everyone who kept commenting that this movie wouldn't have enough kills, it had just as many as the first screen. Don't believe me? Let's go the numbers. <laughs> he so hell. Damn me, you it so hell, man. It gets a little tricky, man. what with the sunken place and all, but I'm gonna say seven people died to get out. My apologies to whoever was chilling inside Grandma and Grandpa Armitage. Of those seven victims, four were male and three were female, a nearly even split between genders. At a runtime of 104 minutes, that comes out to a kill, on average, almost every 15 minutes. Even though in actuality, there weren't any kills until the last 20 minutes of the film. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest death to D. Bruce, you got a, he got a podcast? If he invited me to his podcast, I will go. I say I've ever seen anyone killed with a mounted deer head before, so that's points for originality. Add in the symbolism and the blood, and it's clearly the standout kill of the movie. Can we Don't watch the kill count for the movie? Go to Georgina, cause yourself to get killed in an accident, something. and that's it. Not get now, not, not tonight. This year, and set a few box office records for black filmmakers. It also held 100% on Rotten Tomatoes for a while, and I'm glad it got such a good reception because I'd be happy to see plenty more horror. As a mixed Peele. man, which side up next, we're starting I another choose? big series with Child's Play. But until then, I mean, it depends on how dark you is. It depends on. <laughs> I'm just playing. Um, I don't know, bro. Being mixed is a uh, is a brain fuck. I'm glad I'm uh full purebred, you know. But y'all, I have to go to sleep, bro. It's 6 a.m. I have to go to sleep. I'm sorry. I do. I have to.